This is a full-scale quantum computer. So let's start here, the most important gadget, which is the vacuum system. It produces a vacuum which is much better than the vacuum in outer space. So if you step out of a space shuttle, you have a lot more air to breathe than if you were to be inside oh, wow. one of these vacuum systems. When it comes to describing the universe, there's the physics of the very large, of stars, of planets and galaxies and their gravitational relationships. And then there's the physics of the very small, known as quantum physics or quantum mechanics. So before we do our next story on quantum computers, we need to do a little primer. But I warn you, things are going to get really weird. According to quantum physics, things can be in two different places at, at the, the same, same time. time. This phenomenon is called superposition and can actually be observed in the laboratory where single atoms or subatomic particles can be shown to be in two separate places at once. For more than a hundred years, Einstein and other physicists have been trying to disprove quantum physics because, well, it's just too weird. It simply doesn't agree with what we can see and experience. Einstein called it spooky. Professor Winfred Hensinger is a scientist who embraces this quantum weirdness, asking instead, how can we use these strange properties of the universe? So what was your inspiration for getting into quantum physics? So it all started with a theoretical physicist named Jared Milburn, who had this theory that he could make an atom move forward and backward simultaneously. So that is a possibility in quantum physics. And so what we did is we prepared an experiment, we prepared individual atoms, and we made them move both forward and backward simultaneously. But that's just so counterintuitive, so weird. Am I just not getting it, or is this really difficult to understand? It is counterintuitive because we cannot see these things in the way we can prepare them in the experiment. And in order to understand something, you have to relate that to your personal background. And quantum physics doesn't really happen on a macroscopic scale. You can only observe it really well on a very small scale, on the scales of individual atoms. Currently, the most challenging use of the quantum properties of the universe is in the building of quantum computers. So the way our conventional computers become faster and add more and more transistors into the microchip, however, as components, transistors, are becoming smaller and smaller, it becomes more and more difficult to shrink them further. That's when conventional computers can't really become much faster anymore. So physicists have been scratching their brains for a hundred years on quantum theory. Are you now applying this weirdness to build these computers? Quantum computers are entirely different technology. There's nothing like conventional computers. They're relying on the strange phenomena of, of quantum physics. But rather than just looking at these phenomena, we try to tame them in order to build a machine that is now capable of solving certain problems where even the fastest supercomputer in the world would take billions of years to calculate. That's a whole class of problems that contain many unknown variables such as cancer treatments, forecasting weather and climate change, online security, both for generating security and breaking encryptions, optimizing traffic flows, predicting financial markets, and even gaming. So what's the difference between conventional computing and quantum computing? So quantum computers make use of quantum physics, and as such, rather than coding information as a string of zeros and ones, as classical bits, they encode the information as a string as of quantum bits. And a quantum bit can be zero and one at the same time. So what does that mean? Imagine you have the world's worst memory stick, a memory stick with only two bits, right? So imagine, for example, you write zero, one into your memory stick. Now your memory stick is full, it's, it's done. Now imagine you have a quantum memory stick with two bits instead. In two quantum bits, I can simultaneously write in two quantum bits, zero, 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 one, one zero and one one and that all at the same time now that doesn't really sound that impressive so imagine for example you have a memory stick with 100 bits i can write in 100 bit number into my memory stick but in a quantum memory stick so if i have 
100 quantum bits. Now, that's the number of different numbers I can encode into this quantum memory stick. So you can see how massively large the number of different numbers is I can encode into these just 100 quantum bits. This stuff isn't easy to understand, so let me explain it another way. Imagine that 100 classical bits was enough to encode this book. Well then, 100 quantum bits would be enough to encode this many books at the same time. So you see, quantum computing really could take us into a whole new realm of computation. Two leading technologies have emerged in the race to create a quantum computer. One uses the quantum phenomenon known as superconductivity. The major drawback for this technique is that the quantum computer would need to be cooled to what's known as absolute zero or minus 273 degrees Celsius. Professor Hensinger and his team are working on what's known as the trapped ion technique, where each quantum bit is represented by a charged atom, also known as an ion. But for the quantum superposition effect to work, allowing the trapped ions to represent zero and one at the same time, the ions cannot come into contact with any other matter. This is a full-scale quantum computer. So let's start here, the most important gadget, which is the vacuum system. It produces a vacuum which is much better than the vacuum in outer space. So if you step out of a space shuttle, you have a lot more air to breathe, than in, if you were to be inside oh, wow. one of these vacuum systems. So have a look at this black tube and where it ends just at a window attached to the vacuum system. Behind this window is where the microchip sits. This microchip emits electric fields which now allow us to hold individual atoms just above the surface of this microchip. Now, so really allowing that control yeah. of the ion. Absolutely. So the ion is a quantum bit. And so this device allows us to hold these quantum bits and to shield them from the environment. The way this quantum computer operates is a little bit like a game of Pac-Man, where each atom levitates and moves across the surface of this microchip, then meets a second or third or fourth atom and undergoes logical computations, so logical gates we call them, a sequence, a series of many logical gates give now rise to an algorithm which then allows us to solve a really, really difficult problem. What you see here is a laser. This laser is used to cool ions close to absolute zero to minus 273 degrees Celsius. And so you can use one laser beam to cool all the ions simultaneously inside your quantum computer. It's counterintuitive because usually lasers are used to burn things. That's right, that's How right. How are they used to cool things? So, but here we use a laser beam and we point that laser beam onto a moving ion. And now as the ion approaches this laser beam, it absorbs light. And you can think of light as having some kind of momentum. So as the atom moves towards the laser beam and it absorbs light, it gets little kicks from all the light being absorbed. And that slows the atom down. And this slowing down process corresponds to cooling the atom to a really low temperature. So if something is fast, it's hot. If something is very cold, it's stationary. And once they're entirely still, we use them to execute computations. Now, imagine you'd have a billion ions. Imagine if you needed laser beams to execute logical operations. It's a lot of lasers. Then you need a lot of lasers. You need hundreds of thousands of millions of lasers like this. Imagine how many optical elements you'd need to achieve that. And one of the things we invented here at Sussex is a new technique to execute quantum gates making use of microwaves rather than laser beams. Learning to control billions of ions starts with learning to control just two, or two quantum bits. So here you can see two individually trapped atoms where we have electrodes that are generating electrical currents, electrical fields. And these fields are confining the two ions in space. And so I'm just working with 
two ions, two qubits, and doing experiments on those. Okay, so there's two bright white lights there? Exactly. I'm shining a laser on them, they absorb it, and then they de-excite and they emit light. So what you're seeing is a, a sort of representation of both ions in space. So this is happening in the big metallic chunk of a vacuum system. So can you actually control ions using your mass? You can. So as I said, the ions are themselves confined in space using electrical potentials from electrodes. And you can imagine that if you increase one of these potentials by increasing the voltage put on the electrode, you'll effectively be moving the ion, pushing it one way or pushing it the other way. Here I've got one of the, the voltages that you can control. And if you increase it, you can see that the ions are pushed to the right. And now if I decrease it, you can see the ions are pushed to the left. Wow, so just like in that game of Pac-Man, exactly, you're yeah. able <laughs> to move ions around. Yeah, exactly. It's incredible. OK, so you're trying to get things just right for just two ions. Exactly, and once, once we can say that things are, are perfect the way they are for two ions, then we can apply that to the bigger picture to other experiments we have in the lab for a greater number of ions. So this is a very special machine. So what you see here is a device that combines aspects of all the prototypes you have seen in the laboratory next door. This is a very small scale practical quantum computer that illustrates and demonstrates one of the critical features of quantum computing in general, and that's the idea of modularity. So in the other lab, you were looking at two qubits, whereas with this setup, you're actually adding lots of two qubits together. That's right. So in this device, we really manipulate a large number of individual qubits. We transport them, we shuffle them around inside these microchips. Now, this machine is now on the verge of operating. You can see inside two distinct quantum computing modules, and we've developed a way of making quantum computing microchips that allow us to transport individual trapped ions from one quantum computing module to another quantum computing module. This is going to be a really big breakthrough and, and tremendously simplifies the engineering required to build realistic quantum computers. So I'm never ever going to have a quantum desktop, right? No, absolutely not, unless you have a very, very big desk. <laughs> <laughs> so quantum computers are going to be very, very large. And they have to be large because in order to control these quantum effects, you need to go out of your way to build technology capable of manipulating individual atoms. So none of them is going to be, be very small or very easy to use, but it's going to be unbelievably powerful. And this is what quantum computers are really all about, allowing us to solve problems you could never even dream about solving before. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and hit the bell button below for notifications.